for the first time in this war, the three Allied leaders had at last been brought together from the ends of the earth. The start of the four-day conference in the Persian capital signs the death warrant of Nazi Germany. The joint authors of this momentous declaration have planned the shape of things to come. I was drafted and inducted in June of 43. At the Presbyterian Mission, they had a very fine library on Iran and the Middle East in English, Persian, and French. And of course, I knew French as well as English. And I said to Dr. Elder, I don't know, I'm a historian, but I'm an American historian. I want to know more about this cradle of civilization here in this part of the world while I'm right here looking at it. Sure. That I wrote my own history of Iran. I was told, I was not present here, that at a meeting in the Anglo Persian Institute, the president of the parliament of Iran uh, was handed a copy of my mimeographed pamphlet and unfortunately he could read English and he read the first page and I am told that he threw my pamphlet on the floor, jumped on it with both feet and said these Americans have no right to write about us like this yeah. and immediately got on the telephone to the foreign minister of Iran and demanded that a protest be sent at once to the American ambassador and that this was done very quickly. So after the general got the complaint from the ambassador, he called me in and he said, Rester Holtz, uh, you're an enlisted man, so you're not responsible, uh, but you did a fine job. I have a number of copies of your pamphlet, which I've mailed home to my friends and my family, and I'm not criticizing you at all. We will claim that it is completely uh, inaccessible. A major from our office, whom I knew quite well, got out of the car and reported to the captain of the guard that he had come to get Sergeant Rusterholz and take him to the Russian embassy, where we all knew the conference was being held. Wow. Well, everybody was thunderstruck, including me. <laughs> Imagine sending a big car with a major to get a sergeant to take him to the Russian embassy. So we went to the Russian embassy and here were ring after ring after ring of Russian troops surrounding the embassy and the streets. It covered a solid city block and the streets on the outside of the walls had ring after ring of Russian troops and we were ushered through those believe it or not, as if I were some great celebrity. And I looked and I saw not far ahead of us a soldier and on his shoulder was a circle of five stars. Wow. And it was George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff, I was ushered in to an inner office where I was introduced to Colonel John G. Bottiger, the President's current son-in-law. I found that when you were in very high places, the people were very good to you, to be people like me, although only a sergeant, yeah. because somehow they seemed to be able to size up a person, and they knew that I was not an ordinary GI. And out came Churchill and Stalin and Roosevelt. My God. And I was right there. I was so busy looking at Stalin, who was only eight or ten feet from me, that until somebody bumped my shoulder and I looked around, I didn't realize I was literally rubbing shoulders with Sir Winston Churchill. And then I was tempted to take out my notebook and pencil and walk towards Stalin and ask for his autograph. But I wasn't sure that I wouldn't be shot 40 times by the <laughs> guards if I moved a foot. Yeah. So I controlled myself. And then the president came out of the inner sanctum and he was leaving for home. And the Secret Service men were wheeling him in his wheelchair. 
to the top of the steps in this uh, vestibule and they had laid planks down six or eight steps mm -hmm. which marked the difference between the level of the first floor of the building and the ground outside and there was a port cochere there which was the main entrance. So the, at the top of this, main, this informal ramp the Secret Service men stopped and asked the President, do you want to go down forward or backward? And he hesitated a moment or so. I suppose he was thinking about the very great business they had just finished conducting. And then he said, oh, take me down backward, please. So they swung him around and took him down the planks. And the President craned his head over his left shoulder as if he were watching, as if he were supervising the procedure and kept his hands on the guard wheels of the wheelchair as if he were doing it all alone. Okay. But here were these four Secret Service men whose, what shall we say, whose careers depended on his safety Absolutely. doing the job for him. Yeah. And I still wonder how he was so concerned about such a routine procedure as that. When they got him there, they scooped him up like a great big infant and lifted him bodily out of the wheelchair into the back seat yeah. of the car, and he did not even take one step. Well, when I wrote home about this shortly afterward, telling them this tremendous experience, I had had, I mentioned this, and the chief censor called me in and said, we will not approve your letter if you tell about the president's not taking a single step. They said, that is not permitted for security reasons. Of course, really for public relations sure. reasons, but they called it security reasons. I understood why President Roosevelt privately referred to him as Uncle Joe. Because, believe it or not, he looked like someone's uncle. His face had a pleasant expression. There was nothing brutal or, or what shall we say, malicious about his expression at all. Mm -hmm. He looked like somebody's uncle, a very approachable person. I almost did try mm -hmm. to approach him. Behind him came Molotov, mm -hmm. the foreign minister mm -hmm. of Russia. And believe you me, if there ever was a man who had the expression on his face of a villain, it was Molotov. A dark, black, closed expression like Ivan the Terrible might have had. Mm -hmm. He really looked the part. He was forbidding. Just like his pictures, he was kind of cherubic, as he always looked, mm -hmm. plump, full face, uh, scowling sometimes, but not all the time. He had a sense of humor, I'm told, yeah. but I didn't experience that. And uh, he had a very serious expression on mm -hmm. his face. Mm -hmm. After all, they've been doing very serious business. And uh, he was pleasant. He was the only one of the big three who acknowledged the presence of us ordinary people there. Mm -hmm. and as he was leaving, he gave his famous sign and he said, good night all. Yes. And looked around and smiled at us all. Oh. Well, then you were eyewitness to an extraordinary piece of history. Oh, of course. Of course. I was even at a little tiny bit. Yeah. Of it. Yes.